Welcome to Adroit Reading with Kyle Reed. It's Season 1, Episode 1, the season dedicated to Howard Phillips Lovecraft. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about the sea motives and techniques used in the short story under the title Dagon. This term wasn't actually created by Howard himself, but rather borrowed from culture of Palestine and Mesopotamia, where Dagon is an ancient deity, a fish god. It's also referenced in the text. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. And now let's dive into the story itself. If you haven't read it, don't worry, uh, I'll, I'll do a quick recap. About spoilers, don't worry either, because there is nothing to spoil actually. Like many Lovecraft stories, it starts with a hero who narrates us a story full of terrors and horrors he had encountered. His ship is captured by a German sea raider, then he escapes from it on a boat. And uh, after a few days, he finds himself on some slimy, unending plain full of dead fish. He wanders here and there, finds some ancient carvings, and suddenly he sees him, Dagon himself from whom he runs away in a fit of madness, of course. Afterwards, he remembers but little, and from now on he tries to forget what happened to him taking morphine. That's it. That's the whole story. Not a big one, but fascinating nonetheless. Due to this format, I can't show you the text, but I will make it for you as easy as possible to follow along. So, just brace yourself on this journey. Let's examine the part where the hero finds himself on a slimy expanse of black mire, and he is a journey in this place. Firstly, he describes this place using words, undulations and rolling in the following sentences. A slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended in monotonous undulations. A faraway hummock, which rose higher than any other elevation of the rolling desert. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. These words describe shapes similar to waves we can see on the surface of water. Secondly, the other two sentences, one of which is just before the character finds himself in this place, and the other is when he describes the place itself. It follows. I began to despair upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue, and compare with, the sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh. All right, let's break it down. In the first sentence, we see from the phrase unbroken blue that the sky and the ocean are the one. The ocean reflects the sky forming this unbroken blue. In the second sentence, we see a sky which seemed almost black in its cloudless cruelty. In its cloudless cruelty. Cloudless is important here, not only because the sky is black, not from clouds, but by itself, but also that unbroken blue can only be with the cloudless sky, which is also the case here. In the second part of this sentence, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet, the sky and the surface changed their position. Now it is the sky which reflects and not the surface. Actually, it's not even the sky, but a sky, emphasizing that it's not the sky we're used to, it's some other, different, even alien sky, as if mirroring that reality by thus creating this dreamlike, through the looking glass-esque sequence. Now let's move to the next thing. When the hero ascends the hammock and sees an immeasurable pit or canyon, Lovecraft makes few references to the Greek mythology, which, in the light of the following, is not so random. Firstly, he says, gazing into Stygian deeps where no light had penetrated. The word Stygian means not only very dark, but also refers to the river Styx of the underworld in the Greek mythology. Then he uses two references to Cyclops, 
in the sentences as The wavelets washed the base of the cyclopean monolith and Vast, polyphemous like and loathing, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares. Here the key word is polyphemous, which is the name of another cyclop, the son of Poseidon of Thuse in Greek mythology, by the way. Alright, moving to the next one. This is regarding the river in the sentence as follows. A far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, almost lapping my feet. Which we can assume is the river in the light of gazing into Stygian deeps and this river. We can deduce that it is the symbolic Styx, the river of underworld. And given the fact that this upheaval appeared from underneath, it becomes even more assuring that this place is the connection between these two worlds, the world of humans and this ancient underwater world. I forgot to mention that Styx also connects two worlds, the world of living and the world of dead. Now, we proceed to Dagon itself. He is presented very briefly in scant details in two long sentences. This is intentional because for Lovecraft and the weird fiction genre in a whole, details of monsters are not as important as the effect produced on a person's mind, often resulting in madness. I read it for you. Then suddenly I saw it, with only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters, vast, polyphemus-like and loathing, it darted like stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. What is interesting here is how we, as readers, are led to this climax. The preceding paragraph contains just eight sentences, but they are huge, average length of which is 28 words, the longest sentence there being of 42 words. There the hero describes the carvings on the monolith, fish people and strange forms. Then he says, then suddenly I saw it. Our first response is that we think that he saw something in the carvings, but the abruptness of the previous flow of long sentences draws attention to this sentence, making it conspicuous, imitating the abruptness with which the hero noticed it during the examination of bas reliefs. By the way, it contains just five words. The last sentence in this paragraph, I think I went mad then, containing six words, also is in contrast with the previous two sentences, describing the appearance of Dagon, the hopeless conclusion of his state of mind. The similar effect is employed at the very end of the story, in the last paragraph. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand, the window, the window! What remarkable here is that Lovecraft uses not only short sentences to demonstrate inevitability of the character's demise, but reducing sentences to verbless ones, the sentences where there is no active verb, reducing the character to the single, the window, as this is the only thing what is left to him, or of him.